Dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much, Manos and Manos, for having me again in your wonderful city of Athens. I'm very happy to be here again after two weird and hard years for all of us. So let's get on to the next uh, pathology, calcific tendonitis. What are we doing with uh, these patients? Well, what can we say about epidemiology? There is no clear association with uh, symptomatic diseases. It's rarely associated with rotator cuff tears. And we have a high number of spontaneous healing of these patients. The prevalence is about 8 to 10% in literature in the asymptomatic population. Age, most of these patients are between 30 and 50. Female, more often in both than male. And the localization, I think this is what we all know, is mostly in the supraspinatus tendon, as you can see in this x-ray on the right side. The patient's question is always, what is the reason? Have I done something wrong? What happened? This is largely unknown. We don't know. There is multiple theories. Overuse of the rotator cuff has been um, told in the, in the past. An avascularity of the rotator cuff, erroneous differentiation of the tendon-derived uh, stem cells, also possible genetic uh, predispositions, associations with, for example, diabetes, but there is no conclusive evidence yet. This is what we have to tell our patients. If you look at the pathogenesis uh, from Uthoff, already from 1997, he said this is uh, going on in three different phases. In the precalcific phase, then the calcific phase, as you can see on the bottom, where the deposit forms and changes at the same time. This is where the patients have inflammatory uh, problems and a lot of symptoms. The most pain is in this um, phase going on and the post-calcific phase where these deposits remodel and finally resorb. The clinical presentation, of course, they have an often automatic pain. They have crepitus catching. Some even describe they have like a mechanical block in their shoulder when they move. The exam will show a decreased and for um, sure painful active and also passive range of motion. In some patients, it goes to a pseudoparalysis or looks like a pseudoparalysis because of the pain. And uh, they can have positive impingement tests and evil muscle atrophy or scapular dyskinesia, depending on how long it goes. You're looking at the imaging, I think this is a very important part of the talk. How can we really diagnose this? It's easy in most of the cases. You do an X-ray and you see, like on the left side, the deposit right away. On the MRI, you see it easily uh, as a black dot in the T1. Of course, in the CT scan, you can see it. And what I use routinely in clinics is ultrasound. This is a very nice tool to see it because you have this vanishing uh, of the cortex behind this blackish dot behind this deposit as you see it on the right side. Be careful with the x-rays. In some uh, cases, it might not be seen right away. You see it on the left side if you know there is one, but uh, if you do rotational uh, views, then you can see it right away. It's not always in the supraspinatus. It might be in the subscap or in the infraspinatus as well, and then it's good if you have any rotational x-rays as well, or if you don't want to do so, you do an ultrasound and you can easily detect it as well. In the ultrasound, you can see the different deposit um, denses on the left side. You can see the black vanishing behind it. And um, as it comes to the resorption phase, this um, gets more and more uh, less. On the MRI, why should we do an MRI? In the literature, it says we can also find the concomitant pathologies like, for example, biceps injuries, or we can find any kind of uh, re-tears or tears, sorry, tears of the rotator cuff, concomitant tears. Uh, we will talk about this later because this is not so easy. I use this Gertner classification because it gives a little bit an insight of what is going on right now. If you have this very dense type 1 on the left side, you know that it's still a very solid deposit. And as it gets more and more translucent, type 2, type 3, this is probably the time when you can tell the patient you're going in the right direction and it's um, vanishing over the next period of time. 
What I also use in terms of size of the deposit is the Bosworth classification, five millimeter, five to 15, or bigger than 15, because also this has an influence on the prediction what is going on in the future. Well, the described non-operative treatment, what can we do is, of course, in the first phase, anti-inflammatory agents, physical therapy, subacromial injections, or even oral cortisone therapy, uh, then shockwave therapy, ultrasound guided, uh, percutaneous lavage, and needling, or others which um, I won't talk about because they are not proven at all. Uh, in this study, they found out that most of the patients get better in non-operative uh, treatment over time, about 85 to 90 percent. There is no one conservative treatment better than the other. One third of the conservative treatment uh, patients fail and go to surgery. And in 82 cases, they required concomitant uh, rotator cuff repair. This is a quite high number, and uh, for sure we can discuss this later on. Um, in this study from Ogon, a German group, they could show what other prognostic factors, and they included 488 shoulders in this uh, study. They can say the positive prognostic factors are if we have a Gertner type 3, so what I said, which is already vanishing, which is already getting cloudy, or in the ultrasound, the type 3, which is basically the same. Um, Non-negative uh, prognostic factors are if you have a far medial subacromial extension, an anterior position at the acromion, if you have bilateral uh, deposits, or if you have very big deposits. So this is how you can a little bit estimate what you can tell the patient. Results of shockwave are actually quite good. 50 to 70 percent uh, partially or completely resorb uh, within six months. The pain is reduced. The range of motion is getting better. The high energy shock wave is better than the low energy. This is what we know from this study from Gerdes Meyer in 60% resorption at six months. And in the last study from Deke, we saw that four years follow up, only 20% um, underwent surgery. If you look at the um, ultrasound guided uh, percutaneous lavage, in these studies, which are systematic grievous, they showed that it's a safe and effective procedure. We can discuss this. I have no real experience doing so. I um, want to know what you here are, uh, are doing. On average, 55% pain improvement with 10% minor complications like swelling or, or bleeding in the first phase. Results of conservative treatment overall, high energy shock wave and this uh, ultrasound guided percutaneous needling seem to be most effective uh, non-operative management modalities. There is no high evidence study with a follow-up of more than one year and many modalities like laser therapy, uh, acetic acid or TENS PRP injections only have low evidence and for sure need more examination. If it comes to surgical treatment, in my hands, this is um, not going on within the first six months of diagnosis. Uh, these studies showed excellent results in more than 90% of the treated patients. Atroscopic debridement with or without rotator cuff repair was done, and there was no significant difference if you added a subacromial decompression or not. Um, this is what the surgical uh, treatment is like. I'm not sure if it is running. It should be running now. So you can see this uh, calcifying deposit in the subraspinatus tendon in this case. Now we're already in the subacromial area. You need to do a, a thorough bursectomy. I don't search it from the intraarticular space, but from subacromial. Then you open the tendon, and by using a spoon and a shaver, you get rid of this deposit and um, have this postoperative x-ray. If you have to do a repair, you can go for a single row repair on the left hand side, which is a speed fix technique um, that you see here. I do it for the partial tears. If you really have a complete tear after removal or had it before, I go for a double row repair to enhance biomechanical stability. When do we have to do the repair? This is a quite uh, good question and is not easily to be answered. There is no conclusive evidence. Most studies report a repair in the rotator cuff in the presence of a complete tear on the MRI again. 
I wouldn't rely on the MRI. I will tell you why in a second. Or if it's greater than 50% thickness tear after removal of the calcium deposit, this is more, I think, what we should look at. How does the footprint look like once we are done with our removal? Is there still any attachment of the fibers or really do we have a hole like this uh, on the right hand side? I think there is no discussion if we should repair this or not. Um, are there really any pre-existing rotator cuff tears? If you look at this study, which is uh, from skeletal uh, radiologists, they say there is pre-existing rotator cuff tears in 32 to 56 percent of the cases. And I feel this is not what we have. I feel what we see is an inflammation of the tendon which mimics a rotator cuff tear. And once we go inside, you don't see a tear from the inside and not from the outside. You see problems of the tendon, of course, because there is a calcific uh, deposit. I think this number is very high and this for sure needs uh, re-evaluation. Uh, if you look at the, again at the question, should we repair it or not? You can find both answers in literature. The latest uh, study I found is from 2021. And they said the repair of the rotator cuff had significantly better outcomes than debridement alone. And if you look on the right hand side, Kesta showed excellent clinical outcomes in both groups. Take home message. In most of the population, this is asymptomatic. There is uh, non-operative treatment is successful in a large number of our patients group and should definitely be first line of treatment. Shockwave and the ultrasound guided uh, treatment is the most proven techniques in literature. Atroscopic debridement of recalcitrant cases. If you cannot get along with the um, conservative management, and the title was a little bit, what is the borderline? I think the borderline is given by the patient. Once the patient tells you he's not coming along, he's, he cannot cope with this problem anymore because he comes more and more back and more and more often or doesn't even uh, get any better over months, then you have to discuss the surgical treatment with these uh, patients. Rotator cuff repair in my hands when it's detached from the footprint, when you really have, sometimes you have deposits which are really into the tendon, which you can't really press out of the tendon. So you remove parts of the tendon and you create a hole by removing the deposit. So for sure in these cases, I want to reattach the tendon back to the bone. Thank you very much. And again, Manos and Manos, thank you very much for what you created here in Athens. This is extraordinary.